Okay, let's go to the next slide here. Enoch is a person who in the Bible is kind of listed in the first five books of the Bible. Um, he's, he's what we call a pre-flood patriarch or an antediluvian patriarch. He was one of the people that lived before the time of the flood. So um, I want to also make a little side note. Next slide here. Um, Enoch is also the name of one of these books that some people say there's banned books of the Bible. What I want to do this year is educate the church on, on the Bible as well as talk about what, what, what we're going to be looking at. Um, how many of you have heard of the book of Enoch by chance? Book of Enoch. It's, it's one of the books that's from what's called the Apocrypha. It's a book of, of, um, of, of there's, there's a series of books that Jew, Jews and Christians don't really see as inspired, but they're there. Some people say, oh, these are hidden books that people have tucked away. Like there's some hidden secrets there. No, they're actually very widely available. You can Google them on YouTube. Uh, and, and they're all there. You can see them. They're, they're, they're all there. Um, some people have asked, why are these books not in the Bible? Uh, I know that when I was, was, was first coming to faith, I found these books that were outside of the biblical canon. I'm like, why are these books not there? And so very simply, before we launch into what the Bible says about Enoch himself, I want to just kind of share this with you so we're all aware of what's going on with the book of Enoch. There's a few reasons why the book of Enoch, there's three books of Enoch, why they're not included in the Bible that we have today. First is because, why they're not in the Bible? First, the language. Uh, there's three books, Enoch 1, 2, 3. They're not written in the same language. The first one is written in Ethiopic, that's uh, in Gaed, rather, is what is from Ethiopia. Second was in Old Bulgarian, Russian, Serbian, and third is rabbinic Hebrew. Secondly, if we look at the author, it was said to be from Enoch. Enoch lived way, 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 way long time ago. So he lived before the pyramids, he lived before the flood. So this is, this is someone who probably wouldn't have spoken Bulgarian or Hebrew. Finally, it's weird. Okay, uh, if, if this was going to be, if Enoch was actually the author of the books of Enoch, we should at least have this written in some of the most ancient languages. We're talking about cuneiform, we're talking about maybe even older than Coptic, but the fact that these languages are so new, there's, there's really no way that we could tell this was actually the author. Not to mention, if you read what it says, it's really kind of trippy. It's really kind of weird. Um, it's like he fights like a dragon, and then he goes up to these different heavens. It's, it's, a, it's, a, weird, it's a weird kind of book. And so the, 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 the Judeo-Christian faith has seen it says, it's an interesting book, but it's not, in, it's not what we would consider part of the inspired canon of Scripture, rather than, 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 than put this with the 66 books that we, that we currently believe as inspired. This is kind of like its own thing. So that's, 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 that's the story of the book of Enoch, in case anyone probably didn't ask, but I just wanted to share it with you because it's important for us to be aware because we are living in a world that people are like, oh, the Bible doesn't, the Bible's crazy. I want you all to be informed of what critics around the world are gonna be saying and are saying, have said. Enoch is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, the seventh man from Adam. And he is listed in, like we said, in the books of Genesis. The chronology, there comes a point right after Adam that you start saying, some person begat some person, and this person lived 900 years, and this person begat blah, 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 and it goes through. Enoch is kind of right in the middle. You notice something very different about his timeline, right? It's significantly shorter than everyone else's. So we look through the Bible, and according to what the Bible story is in, in that, those first few books of the Bible, back, go back, go back, go back. Here, let's just stick, park at this one for a second. People back then, apparently, they lived a really, really, really long time. So can you imagine the, 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 the conversations back then of, you know, when I was your age. <laughs> can you imagine those conversations? Ah, oh, you're 400 years old. When I was your age. <laughs> you know, man, people lived like, man, this is, this, is, this is crazy. I don't know, for me, this is crazy. This is a long, long stretch of time that people are said to have been living. But Enoch, apparently, is just, boom, right in the middle of this almost in the middle of this, of this, of this span of time. So here's what we actually have, now to the next slide. Here's the actual um, textual evidence that we have for Enoch. This is what the Bible tells us about this, this man, this patriarch named Enoch. It says, Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. And he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were, what does it say there? 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Before we go to the next slide, um, it, I, I know a lot of people are like, oh, isn't it crazy that Enoch walked 365 years with God and we have 365 days. I want to just 
it's cool, but that's not the same calendar. The, it's not, just want to let you guys know that we're on the Gregorian calendar, and the fact that you walk 365 is great, but it's not like it was on purpose. It's a different calendar. But it's interesting, you walk 365 years with God. Next slide. The question is, what allowed Enoch to walk with God and then just be taken by God? I want to break this down. I think there's four things that we have to look at in just this passage that tell us what happened in Enoch's life that allowed him to prevail, allowed him to, to, to surpass the challenges of his surroundings. First of all, we find that, back, 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 back. We have this. It's the fact that Enoch lived 65 years, and let's say that it's bold. He became a father. He became a father of Methuselah. You know, it's funny to me, it says, he became the father of Methuselah, and it says, and then Enoch walked with God 300 years. This is different. If you look at the rest of the, the, the chronologies, it just says, so-and-so begat so-and-so. He lived 300 years, and he died. This guy begat this guy. He lived blah, 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 blah. He begat so-and-so, and then he died. But this is the first time that it mentions something about, then he walked with God. So apparently something happened in his life after he became a dad. In my opinion, because it says he became the father of Methuselah, and then, which any English student will know that it's, it's a, as a result of it, then he walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. Does anyone relate to this idea that being a parent changes things? Can anyone relate to the idea that, that, that there's certain um, points in your life that become watershed moments that you're not the same person after that fact? There are certain key moments that come into our lives that mark a starch difference from one point to the next. You say, I am not the same person I was before that happened. Apparently something, let's go to the next slide here. Something shows us that there can be watershed moments in our lives that can lead us closer or farther away from pre prevailing. I can share in my life, when I became a dad, 2016, it was just the craziest thing. I mean, you know about something conceptually, right? But for, in my life, when I saw that baby for the first time, I was like, whoa. <laughs> and then it, it's, 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 it's even more amazing after the fact because you have to wake up every night, you have to take care of him. It's nothing, nothing compared to what my wife went through. I'll tell you that. Women, you know this. I mean, parents, listen, dads, they went through the process of pushing a human being through their body. The most you can do is change diapers. Okay, change the diapers. Do what you can because it, it's just such an amazing experience. But that point, that, 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 that event just changed my life. For the better, it, it caused me to be more responsible, you could say, it caused me to be on my game a little more because I said, There's, here's another little human being that depends on me. No one's gonna watch out for him. No one's gonna teach him Spanish like I can. I mean, that's gonna be a challenge because you're gonna speak much Spanish at home, so pray for me in that one. But the idea is that there's something that happens in these moments. Now what about for you? There's maybe moments in your life that you realize, oh, this is a, mo a moment that I can't let go. Maybe it was um, a, 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 a relationship. Maybe it was uh, a, something that someone did or something happened to you. Maybe something happened in your job. Maybe it's something that happened in your school. There, there's these watershed moments where we say something has to change. And that is what happened in the life of Enoch. I'm just saying this. Next slide. Um, there's actually someone that, that writes about this. Ellen White, a, a Christian author in her book, Adam at Home, she actually says this. She says, after the birth of his first son, Enoch reached a higher experience. He was drawn into a closer relationship with God. He realized more fully his own obligations and responsibility as a son of God. And as he saw the child's love for its father, its simple trust in his protection, as he felt the deep yearning and tenderness of his own heart for that firstborn son, he learned a precious lesson of the wonderful love of God to men in the gift of his son, and the confidence which the children of God may repose in their heavenly father. So something about having a kid changed his life. So that's why the Bible says, and then he walked with God. Next slide. So we go back to the story of Enoch. Again, we've established that something changed after he had a son. So these watershed moments in our lives allow us to, 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 to see the world a little bit differently. We can come to these important crises moments in our lives and either be drawn closer to God or be pushed further away from God. Okay? The second thing that happened is Methuselah. Let's talk about Methuselah. So who is Methuselah? <laughs> he is... 
listen. Um, the ultimate, you know, the ultimate joke, your mom was so old, that's this guy. He's like the author of it. He was almost a thousand years old. His name means a man of the dark or spear, or check this out. Alternatively, his name in the Hebrew can mean his death shall bring judgment. Now, why is that significant? Next slide. Because you see when Methuselah, this long line finishes, you see all four of them kind of stop right around the same time. You know, if you look at the Bible and you, you follow the, the numbers and you add them up, you know what sort of happened around this end of the right there? Was the flood. Was the flood. So again, the names mean something and his name either means son of the spear or means his death shall bring judgment. Something fascinating to me, I, we don't know the whole story of this, but there, there must have been something fascinating about what happened in his birth. Because for Enoch to name his son, his death shall bring judgment. For, them, for that to be the point that he decides to walk with God, something must have happened. You imagine being Methuselah, going to school, um, roll call, Methuselah. Methuselah? Doesn't that name mean his death will be judgment, you know? Okay, Methuselah, here, present. And then when the guy starts getting older and older, like, is he, is, is he okay? Is he, you know, people started getting worried if this guy was, was dying soon because his death shall bring judgment. So there's different versions of, of, uh, of, of what happened after he died, but the idea is that the flood happened shortly after Methuselah died. Now, here's also something interesting. Go back, go back, go back. Something interesting, this is a side note, um, as far as the people that knew each other. I just find it, this is a point that I, I think is just fascinating for me to hear, um, or fascinating for, for me to understand, is that you look at the lives of all these people according to the Bible chronology. So it's possible that Adam knew Enoch, and Enoch uh, is, obviously knew Methuselah. No, excuse me, Adam knew Methuselah, and Methuselah no, knew Noah. So we have just three generations between creation and the flood that knew each other. So we had Adam lived all this time and he overlaps with Enoch. He overlaps with Methuselah. They knew each other for several hundred years until Enoch was taken away. Methuselah lived several hundred years there after that. Noah came. Why is this important? Because the, the story of creation and the fall must have been passed down almost without break. Because they knew each other. Do you know, you, you, how many of you remember your grandparents? If you live with them, you remember some of their stories. You remember hearing what happened when they were children and whatnot. And I just spoke to my wife's grandmother this last week. So imagine hearing the story of creation from Adam. Your great, 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 great grandfather. Imagine that. That's amazing to me. So if, if this is to be believed, then it is possible that, the, that the, the story that we heard in Scripture is kind of what happened. Because it was passed down several generations and without, without a break. So let's go here. We know what happened at the time of the flood was a very terrible thing because it says that there, were, there was wickedness on the earth. And God came to the point that he decided to wipe everyone out. So this tells us that the condition of the world is not an inhibitor to prevailing. What's going on around us in the world today? Is it? Is it? I mean, listen, there, there used to be a point where you had... <laughs> how do I say this? Um... There, there used to be some time, there used to be a point where you, you would put kids away when you would have certain conversations. Right? You would have certain conversations in front of children. You say, this is, you know, but we're having some of these conversations openly now as a society. There, there used to be a point where you could come to churches and feel this was a safe place. You used to be a point where, where, where things used to be different. There used to be, you know, the world isn't getting any better, folks. This is what happened in the time of Enoch. Enoch lived in this time where things were getting from bad to worse, and it would get worse after his time. But that still was not something that inhibited him from walking with God. As a matter of fact, it's something that may have been a challenge for him. It says, yeah, I have to walk with God in this, in this, in this society. But it is possible to walk with God. And I want to tell you, no matter what you may be going through in your life, no matter what you may be seeing around this society, it is still possible to have an active, living, foundational, strong walk with God today. It's possible. It is possible. So the condition of the world is not an inhibitor to prevailing. Next slide. So we see what happened. It says, then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Muslim. 
He walked with God 300 years. Now, what do you think happened those 300 years of walking with God? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But here's this. I, 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 we live very short periods of time compared to what the folks back then did, if we're to believe that. So 300 years of walking with God required a lot of patience, a lot of time. I realize that myself, I get frustrated when I don't hear answers to prayer in two minutes. You know what I'm saying? So what must have been like to walk with God? In my opinion, it must have been one, a, 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 an experience of patience. Next slide. One thing I will say, I was, we were reading this passage on prayer meeting, uh, Tuesday morning prayer meeting at five in the morning, and this section really caught my attention. When it comes to walking with God and seeking answers to prayer, this author, um, Wesley Sewell, says something like this. It's always God's will to save the lost, bless his people, revive the church, and extend his kingdom. It may or may not be God's will to give a person employment at the exact time you suggest. The person prayed for may be out of God's will in some matter, and God may be teaching a specific lesson that takes time to learn. Time to learn. God may need to teach that person faith. God may have a better opportunity a little later, and a host of other possibilities may be involved. Success in a particular matter, such as healing, the election of a particular person, or matters of setting a church, settling a church dispute, involves many, many, say many possibilities of God having a plan that you are unaware of. So, when Enoch walked with God for 300 years, it required him to have patience to see God's answers come about. You imagine what it's like just walking, living for 300 years. You know, when we, when we seek God's answers in such a short period of time, even in our lifetimes, 30 years, 60 years, isn't a long time compared to the time God has to live. God doesn't live, He is. But even Enoch walked with God 300 years. How much time do you think went from hearing an answer to prayer to having an answer to prayer in his life? See, here's the reality. Next slide. Is that um, the process of prevailing is not a quick one. It's not. It's not as if we say, oh, I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to uh, get baptized. And then the next day, everything's going to be great in my life. That all my problems are going to go away. No, a lot of times, what ends up changing is your mindset first. And then you decide to be a better person. God works within you. And once you submit your life to Him, He begins this process of transformation. But it isn't something that happens one week to the next, or two months, or three weeks, or even in a year, or two years, or ten years' time. Process, this transformation process, the process of prevailing takes time. So, consider this. Next slide. God prepares leaders in slow cookers, not in microwave ovens. God prepares people in slow cookers. You know what I'm talking about? Slow cookers, sometimes they take eight hours, 12 hours to make, but the food comes out really, really good. And not in microwave ovens, it's like the first three minutes, no. We, we, we are unfortunately microwave, we have, we're people of microwave faith. That we want things done on our time, and then we've prayed for three years, God. Three years, four years, God. We've been praying for 10 years, God. We've been at this for 20 years, God. I've been living for 40 years, God. Father, I've been praying for this for 60 years, God. Well, guess what? Do you know how long people back then lived? 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years was nothing. Was nothing. It was nothing. So what is that to God? We have to realize that sometimes the answers to our prayers may take time. But the idea of praying to God and asking that, it's not always about the answer to prayer. It's about drawing us into a closer relationship with God. Because ultimately what God wants to do is what happened in Enoch's life. Next slide. Because over the course of those 300 years, next slide. Next slide. Okay, now we need the microwave. Boop, boop. Next slide, thank you. Thank you. Over the course of those 300 years, God and Enoch developed an intimate relationship with one another. Intimate relationship. They knew each other. They walked with God. It says he walked with God uh, 300 years. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And it wasn't that something happened in Enoch's life and he died. And, and it says here, and he, uh, Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And I'm like, what, what does that mean? 
What does that mean? Next slide. I, I actually try to break it down in the Hebrew. And so it says, it, it basically says, Shavarok vayit tarlek ha Elohim Elohim lacha. It doesn't get much clearer than that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how you can cut it any other way. It literally says over here, Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God, lacha is the verb. God took him. That's the Hebrew word for, for took. Lacha, took him. How do you explain that? Over here, um, it's very fascinating, this, this, this uh, lexicon. Uh, it, it, the, the rest of the words are very self-explanatory, like God and halak for to walk. Elohim, it means the, the, the name for God or goddesses. But when it, took, when it, when it looks at laha, take at the bottom, it says to take, and in parentheses, in the widest variety of applications. In the widest variety of it says like, we don't really know how he took him, but it says he took him. Many um, biblical commentators would say that this means that Enoch was literally taken by God to heaven. God had such an, an intimate relationship with this man that says, I cannot bear the thought of seeing this man die. I need to have him in my presence now because I cannot have this, this situation where I lose this man because we have such a wonderful relationship. I don't want to wait till I come back in the clouds of heaven the second time. I want him in my kingdom today. So he takes this man, just takes him, and he was no more because he walked with God. So I think God wants to take all of us. But the question is, where does, that, where does God want to take you today? We can have an experience with God where God can take you from one victory to the next. Where God can take you from your situation that you're living in right now, in your home, or your job, or your work, and take you to a better experience. God wants to take you to, from, from this point in your relationship with Him to this point in your relationship with Him. And ultimately what God wants to do in this, this, this season of getting to know Him and during the, the, the years and the decades that you walk with Him, the end result of prevailing is a life of constant trust in your Creator despite your context. Enoch lived that in his life. He had a relationship with God so much so to the point that he was able to walk with God no matter what happened. And there came a point that God decided to take him. God took him and he was no more. But God wants to take you on a journey as well. Just like he took Enoch. The question is, next slide. What would your life look like if you decided to walk with God, if you like to walk with God like Enoch did for 365 days? Enoch lived for 365 years in total, and again, it doesn't mean that it was it's a different calendar, it's not the same calendar, but it does apply to us. We have 365 days in our year, in our calendar year. What would your life look like if you walked with God for just one year? Enoch walked with God for 300 years. What would your life look like if you decided to walk with God every day this year? Where could God take you? Where could God take your family? Where could God take your, 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 your life? Where could God do that? Where, how could God do that? Just think about that. Next slide. You know, a lot of times, I think we sell ourselves short over what God can do. I, uh, I came back from Boston. Um, we were there over Christmas break. Um, we were in Boston for Christmas break. It was wonderful. I, I had a, a white Christmas. It snowed uh, at the house. I was plowing. I was plowing snow on Christmas Day. How you like that? I'm never coming back to Boston for like two years. I was like, I need to be in Miami, I need to be back in Miami. So when we left the airport last Friday, Sarah? Friday? It was negative 16. Negative 16. And we're here complaining, oh, it's 40 degrees. <laughs> Listen, when it gets so cold, you can't feel your face. You know what I'm talking about? You can't feel your face, that's when you know it's, 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 it's winter. Terrible, right, Blair? You were up, you were up in, uh, in in Baltimore area, like that. It's cold, man. So I get back, and um, if you were trying to send a uh, a New Year's text, um, I didn't get it. I didn't get it because something happened. Um, <laughs> my phone broke. So what happened was, um, I'm going to share this. I didn't share it online. So what happened was that we were coming back from Fort Lauderdale in the airport, and. My father-in-law and my dad came to pick me up, and uh, you know, in the in the hello, blah, blah blah, I was putting Isaac in the car. I ended up leaving my phone on the roof of my car. 
And I was like, hmm, we, were, we were on the driveway leaving Fort Lauderdale, um, leaving the, 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 the lanes, and I'm like, I need to call my dad, where is it? So we have you seen my phone? And she's like, I haven't seen your phone. She's like, she's like you know, look at, look at uh, find my phone. Find my phone is a wonderful feature. So she's like, your phone is back at the airport. And I'm like, oh, okay, maybe it fell on the sidewalk. And, and I asked her, hey, let me, let me get your phone. And the phone actually wasn't on in the airport. It was like on the highway. And I was like, oh, oh my phone. Oh, oh my gosh. So I was like, okay, okay, don't freak out, don't freak out. All right, game plan, all right, don't freak out. Find my phone. Apparently Apple has this thing that it, it gives you directions, folks. It gives you directions from where you're at wherever to your phone. So I was on the highway and I said, veer off here. And it started taking me back to the location of my phone. And so I was going by and we, we went by the, the 836 and, or, or the, um, the 395, went back to the airport and went through the, um, through, through the, the, uh, the, the airport and it wasn't there. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's not at the airport. It's not at the airport. It's on the side of the road. And so I see this little black dot little black dot coming up and I come up beside it and I pick up my phone and I want the camera to see this if you can switch the camera so you all can see this phone uh, I look I look at my phone and my phone can we zoom, zoom in here like that like that on the side of the road on 395 this. It's, it's, you know, my father-in-law was like, you know, you should have had a glass protector on you. <laughs> like, ah, that's what I was missing, glass protector. This thing flew off the roof of my car at like 70 miles an hour. Probably several cars ran it over and I needed a glass protector. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Man, I took this thing home and I was like, I can't even open this. For me, it would have been a problem, but I had my son's photos in here. You know, as, listen, I didn't upload this to the cloud, and you know you don't want to lose those photos. You don't want to lose those videos. And so I was like, I need to find a way to fix this. So I call Apple. I'm an Apple, my phone broke. How do I fix this? And they're like, we, they, we talked about it, they're like, you can't, you, can't, you can't fix this. Based on what you're, you're describing, Mr. Fernandez, um, did you leave your, your does, does your, does, does your, are your pictures on the cloud? I, I didn't, no, I did put it on the cloud. Uh, okay, well, it's gonna cost you about $250 for us to at least repair the screen, but that doesn't guarantee we'll be able to save your phone or if we're even gonna be able to fix it. And so I was like, oh my goodness. So I, I, I say thank you so much, and I, this phone didn't have insurance. It didn't have insurance. I was like, why am I gonna need insurance? I keep my phone right next to me at all times. Until I don't. Lesson learned. All right. <laughs> Anyways, okay. I, I do have insurance now. Um, <laughs> so I go to the mall. My dad says, "Hey, listen. There's this place I can repair phones. They can repair phones. I see them do miracles." So I go by my house and I'm like, um, "Guys, you guys do miracles?" The guy goes, <laughs> "Nope." <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh man." And I was like, "What am I gonna do? I I I don't I don't." I, I have no way to fix this. And then I was like, you know what? I, I, I really, I'm, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. If I don't do anything, I lose my son's photo. If I do something, I may break the phone. And so, I mean, Apple said they couldn't fix it. The, the experts said they couldn't fix it. So what do I have to lose? I decided to go to the next best thing, YouTube. So I'm like, YouTube, how do I fix this? How do I fix a broken phone? And none of the phones had this level of damage. They only had a little crack. But they're like, well, basically, if you have a phone that you can't see the screen anymore, you're going to need a whole new screen, not just the glass. You're going to need a whole new LCD screen. And so I went online, and I'm like, I, this isn't my field, but I decided to look for a, a, a case of an LCD screen, and I bought this. This, this, this is not an advertisement. I'm just gonna, I bought this. 20 bucks online. So the next weekend, I was like, all right, I'm going I'm to try to fix this. I, 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 I sit down after my son's taking a nap. I sit down, and I follow it an instructional video on YouTube. And I try to fix it, I work it out, I twist this, I twist that, I take this out, I'm like, man, this is crazy, like, I, 
this, these little components are so small. I, I, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just trying to follow instructions until the point where somehow, some way, I was able to come up with this. You see this? This is the phone that came from this. The same phone, except what was broken wasn't the whole phone. The whole phone was broken. The screen was shattered. This was the screen. And actually a little bit on the, on the right side was shadowed the case. Thankfully, I had an OtterBox. <laughs> OtterBox, hey. OtterBox saved it, mostly. Um, the, the, only, the only trace of the accident is this little wedge here that slightly opens up, reminding me, <laughs> reminding me of what happened. But other than that, the phone works, it turns on. The only reason I haven't turned it on is because I didn't charge it. I ended up not having enough faith and I asked my dad, my father-in-law to give me a new phone and I got another phone. But this phone works. This phone works, it's fine. I'm not asking you to buy it, I'm just, just, I'm just saying this phone works. There's a homiletical point to this. There's a homiletical point to this. Same phone. Same phone, okay? Same phone. This phone was smashed and ended the year on a terrible note, if there, any, if there was one. The experts said it couldn't be fixed. They said throw it away, you gotta get another one. But to me, this phone was valuable. I knew it had to be saved. So I did whatever I had to do to get my son's photos out of this. And it worked. By God's grace, I took this out and I was like, thank you. God, thank you, God. Your phone for the cloud, for the YouTube, for everybody, everybody paid a role in this one. This was great. But your story, your life may be like this cracked phone. People may have given up on it. They may say there's no hope for this. You might as well just throw in the towel. There's no hope for saving this. Do something else. Go to somewhere else. But you know, folks, there sometimes comes a point that you have to stop listening to what people say. You have to stop listening to what everyone says. Well, you're probably not gonna listen. You, at some point, have to start listening to what God says. Amen. Because who knows you better than your creator? Amen. Who knows you better than the one who made you? I didn't know this one, but I was able to restore it back to somehow working condition. What can God do with you? Who made your life? Who you're more precious in sight than a phone could ever be? So, next slide. Remember that you will never reach a higher standard than what you yourself set. So aim high. This was said by Ellen White in the context of the next slide, is in Christ's Object Lessons. She says, be ambitious for the master's glory, to cultivate every grace of character in every phase of your character building you are to please God. This you may do. For Enoch pleased him through living in a denigrate age. And there are Enochs in this our day. There are many Enochs here today that may have had an experience just like this that was broken, that was shattered. You may have had a watershed moment with God where you came to God and said, Lord, I cannot continue my life as it's currently going. You need to take a hold of the wheel. If not, I'm not going to be able to do this. It might have been a child, might have been a situation in your job, might have been a situation at your home, your marriage, your relationships. Whatever it may be, you come to a watershed moment and you said, God, I want you to be in control of my life. So you decide to walk with God. Praise the Lord. But the journey doesn't start, stop there. It just starts. And on that moment, God wants to take you on an adventure that can last a lifetime. It can last years. But once that happens, through the course of day in and day out, getting to know God, trying to intersect your faith in your work, in your job, in these areas, God is molding you to be the person who we always knew you could be. He's, tra he's changing you to be a leader that will transform the world, starting with your home. So, what would it look like, next slide, if our church were to be a transformed church? What if everybody in our church were to be like Enoch? We would all have our smashed screens, you know, that, that's, still, that's still dropping LCD glass here at the pulpit. So I need to wipe this up here. But we all, with our brokenness, we come together to God and say, God, you can take our brokenness and make something special out of it. What would it look like if everyone for 365 days were to come together as a, as a group of people and do something special for the Master? I want us to dream about that today. And I want us today to make a, de a decision, a resolution to walk with God this year. 
I don't know what your past may have been. I don't know what your experiences may have been. But I do know, and I want to tell you, that you're, you're, this, this year with God can be a watershed moment for you and your life. It can be. The question is, what will you do with the opportunity that God gives you? I want to invite Roger up to stage here with me. Because we have a very special um, a very special, uh, uh, very special time today. Last week we had the privilege of seeing a young man, Nathan, give his heart to the Lord. And today I want to share with you guys, I'll introduce that to Roger, introduce the story of someone who, just, who had a watershed moment in their experience. And hear from him what can God do in his life and then what God can do in your life. Take care. Happy Sabbath. 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 It's the first time I've ever said those words. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for the words that came from the brothers. From our pastor. Yes, I was listening throughout the last year and a half. I listened to my wife for 18 years and I never heed a word. When I was 16, I ran away from the Catholic Church because I didn't believe in some of the things that was being said to me. And I turned my back and started believing that I could do things on my own. I didn't need anyone. 18 years, uh, 12 years, uh, sorry, 15 years ago, my wife couldn't, she was, was not able to get pregnant. And we prayed, I prayed. This was one of the first times I went back to my knees and I prayed, God, I would do anything for you if you could just give me my wife, a baby girl, a baby boy. And he did. And I thought to myself, I'd be very dedicated, but I fucked myself again on my own whatever it is, ignoring the very things that I promised I would have done. And along the way I began achieving many things, you know, doing great things, but giving thanks to the Lord when I got it, and then gone on my own again, doing whatever I want. Last year, January 1st, I promised I was going to, you know, surrender my life to God. But throughout the year I was just listening to these two, listening to the pastor, Listening to the words that came out and always questioning everything, always. No, I don't think what they said was right and I would go back and research it and do everything that I can. And then came the topic of transformational leader. And remembering that Jesus Christ is the greatest transformational leader that existed. As said by John Maxwell, Socrates taught for 40 years, Aristotle for 50, Pluto for 40. Jesus taught for three years and changed the world. And I knew to myself that there was something that's happening there. When I faced major difficulties in my life this year, when I was told that I was no longer going to have a job, the very thing that I worked very, very hard for, after working many, many years to secure that would never happen to me, it happened this year. And I hid in shame. I hid in shame because the press made me feel bad and I felt Everyone was, you know, I, I just couldn't go out to the world and tell them what happened. And I could have easily decided to change my life and move away from God, but I fell back to my knees. I knew that getting a job was going to be very hard because as a president, no one wants to hire you. I went on many interviews and many say, well, why are you taking this job as a president? Why would you step down? And everyone was turning me down. But when I fell to my knees and started praying and Knowing what I've heard and knowing what I felt, knowing what my wife would always tell me, the whole world began changing. Every interview I would go and I would go for the position and I was now making choices. Things was happening to me where my friends who this very same happened to me, today they're still in despair. They're still wondering what would happen to them. But everything began changing for me. And today, when the great news came that I was going to be a college president, the very thing that I worked very hard for, I knew I did not get it on my own. I knew it was something that was given to me that I worked hard for, and maybe I didn't even deserve. And so I know that anything that I that have achieved along the way, I did not do it on my own. Jesus was always there. I just chose to ignore that he was the one that was helping me. I was very, very upset when all of this happened and I could have easily turned my back. But thank God, in, the spread, in, 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 in all that was bad was happening, I could have gone the other way, but these folks kept me along with my wife where I needed to be. And I praise God for that. Amen.
invite the family to come, come forward just to fill in the gaps. He moved here from Virginia, right? To be the campus president of Miami Dade. And last year, because of budget cuts, he was laid off. And so the reason why he came here now was taken away. But God had a plan. Because now he is the college president of Hudson Valley College Hudson Valley in Albany, New York. So he had to come to Miami to get hired in Albany. But before he got hired, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. So he's graduating today. Graduating today, and someday God will give you that diploma when he will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Wife, you want to say something? Come on, I, I, I know, I know. I just want to say I've been praying for years, two years. When my daughter and I got baptized in um, Manassas, Virginia, we prayed, our church there prayed, the pastor prayed for him. But um, pastor told me there in Manassas, um, just live your life and he'll come to Christ. Don't, don't worry and don't, don't force anything. It will happen in time. And it did. Father God, you are sovereign God. You know the beginning and the end. Father, when Ron Jeremy, Ron Sammy was in his mother's womb, you saw this moment. And so, Father, I ask that you may continue to bless him. You've heard his testimony. It is my privilege and honor to baptize him. And so, Lord, as he goes down the watery grave, that you may forgive him of his sins. And as he comes up under each creation, that you may empower him with your Holy Spirit to expand the kingdom of God there in Albany and wherever you may take him. But, Father, it is my honor to baptize Roger in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thank you. 